Hi, thank you so much for the lovely intro. And those two videos were really beautiful, weren't they? Right? And although I unfortunately won't be singing or writing poetry about my science, when you really think about it, I'm not just speaking about science. I'm communicating to you through words and language. And if there's one reason why I would say I'm actually in front of you all here today, it's because as a child and continuing to this day, I really just love language. So when I was really young, before science trickled its way into my soul and I really came to love it, I actually very much loved creative writing. I like to take people and ideas and situations and just throw them all together and use my subconscious human intuition to really figure out how the world worked and why people acted as they did. This is really just experimentation in disguise when you think about it. And another thing that I really love about language is thinking about words and the original context in which they were spoken. Case in point, our school's motto is actually this idea here, not for ourselves alone. And when I was young, I had a really tough time trying to understand how this motto could do a good job as a personal philosophy. Because the complete selflessness that's really advocated by this motto, it doesn't really leave a lot of room for your own personal happiness and self-actualization and growth. And over time, I actually came to realize that saying not for ourselves alone actually implies something more. It means that there is room for you to align your own personal happiness with the safety and welfare and well-being of others. So keeping this in mind, I returned to my two main passions at the time, which were creative writing and science. And I asked myself, how can I take these two different streams and bring them together to create something that's really meaningful both for me and for others on this planet? And the inspiration for my research actually arose at the convergence of two seemingly unrelated fields. The first was a poem on the AIDS epidemic back from 1980, and the other was a piece of scientific literature on HIV diagnosis. As I really dove into this research, I also came to see how research and science in many ways is just another form of co communication, and as such, it's open to rhetorical analysis, because really what science is is this exchange of language and ideas between the natural world and scientists and other people with whom the scientists are communicating their ideas. So thinking about research in this way really opens us up to think about the entire process as a whole and try and pinpoint where its weaknesses are. So this is that really classical scientific method that you'll hear about in all of your grade eight science workbooks. And it all begins with people going out into the field and conducting interviews with different individuals and trying to identify some sort of problem in the world today. They're gonna take those interviews and then you know, gather the data from that, analyze it, synth synthesize it in some sort of paper on PubMed, which is like an online repository of scientific articles. Then, on the other side of this divide, you're gonna have a tenure track seeking researcher with 20 years of experience in one really narrowed focused stream of science usually. And they're gonna come with all of that knowledge about their technology. They're gonna look at one of these papers and they're gonna think, okay, here's my technology, here's a problem, this would be a pretty cool application for my technology. And then they're gonna go ahead, they're gonna create some sort of really interesting innovation. And before you know it, the link between that innovation and the people that it's trying to help has been lost. And the way that I like to think about this is actually like a massive game of telephone, right? Who played this as a child? Yeah, right? By the time the words come back around, they've actually lost all meaning. And where do these words really lose meaning? Where's the breakdown in communication? I talked about all of these articles on PubMed. These articles have a bunch of words and a bunch of buzzwords, right? Point of care, low resource, low cost. And the great Western affliction is that we are so deeply entrenched in our everyday experience that we forget to understand that when we approach these articles, we have such bias, right? What does low cost mean to you? Someone give an example of what a low cost device would be. $5 maybe, 10, 15, right? That's, you know, that's maybe the cost of a meal at McDonald's, for example. 
But turning it back on its head, we realize that our interpretation of these terms are so ill-defined and divorced from reality. There's that broken link between reality and interpretation. So coming from this position of you know, not being a tenor track seeking prof looking to apply my technology to some sort of problem area, I was actually at an advantage because I could turn the research process on its head. Instead of beginning with the technology, I began with this big, broad problem. And for me, that was, how can we improve the health of recently diagnosed HIV-positive individuals worldwide? And although at the core of my research and what I'll be talking about today, it's this piece of technology around the size and weight of this, I aim to provide not just the means, but the ends as well. And what this really entails is conducting rapid diagnosis at the patient bedside or the point of care as it's most commonly known, and then linking this with immediate therapy, counseling, and treatment such that we can minimize the risk of transmission between infected individuals and also be able to stage the disease and give the patient the best drugs available. As researchers, it's really important that we place our work in context because only through understanding the numbers and the geographic hotspots of this disease can we really pinpoint the weaknesses of our current approach. It's also our job as researchers to understand that there are large NGOs, large governmental programs which exist out there. For example, the UNAIDS 1990-90 plan, which is about diagnosing 90% of individuals, treating 90% of those diagnosed, and effectively suppressing the virus in 90% of those treated. Through understanding that these big frameworks exist out there, we have to think about how the technologies we create can really enhance these frameworks, because we can't revolutionize the system with a small lab. You have to be able to marry your technology to programs that already exist out there. This is the continuum of HIV care. And in recent years, we've really seen a growth in the number of NGOs and governments that are rolling out antiretroviral therapeutic drugs for HIV. So the problem really isn't that much with treatment. If we take a step back and think about it holistically, we actually see that our weaknesses in our current approach are when it comes to diagnosis or identification of the disease and monitoring the disease. So when I set out to somehow tackle this big problem of improving the health of HIV-positive individuals worldwide, for me that really entailed A, creating a device that can perform early rapid diagnosis of HIV in adults before six to 12 weeks post-transmission and in infants under the age of 18 months, creating a device that can properly stage the infection by looking at exactly how much virus is present in the patient's bloodstream, and finally creating a device that is able to actually see whether the patient has a particular strain of HIV that is resistant to certain drugs, and if this is the case, predicting which drug, which combination of drugs cocktail will work best for tackling the virus in their bodies. This goal really called for the marriage of two seemingly unrelated fields. The first is nucleic acid testing, which permits early identification of the disease with microfluidic technology. And microfluidics are essentially these tiny analogous to computer chips which run entire biochemical processes on these tiny substrates. So we now know what we're looking for. We're looking for the earliest predictor of HIV infection. But what is that really? There are two main biomarkers in the bloodstream when it comes to HIV diagnosis. The first are these HIV antibodies. And HIV antibodies are produced by the patient in response to the presence of the virus in their bloodstream. But the issue is that they only appear around 6 to 12 weeks post-transmission in adults. And in infants who are born to HIV-positive mothers, the mother will actually give the infant her antibodies to HIV for up to 18 months post-birth, which means that if we're looking for antibodies in children, we can't actually do this because we'd get a lot of false positive results. 
So the alternative to antibodies are actually these HIV nucleic acids, which are directly associated with the presence of the virus itself. They're the genomic information that's locked away within those virus particles right there. And what's great about these is that we can actually push the window period of detection back to at most seven days post-transmission, which really minimizes the risk of patient-to-patient -patient transmission um, for those who are unaware of their HIV status. So we have a drop of patient figure sick blood, like with a lancet if you just had a drop of blood. We know what we're looking for. We're looking for the HIV nucleic acids. Now how do we really get there? The first step is actually to filter out all of these components in the bloodstream that could be potentially inhibitory. And for us that means taking away all of the red blood cells, all the white blood cells who are left with just patient serum. We then have to burst apart these HIV virus particles in order to reveal the HIV RNA within. RNA is this just a, double sh a single stranded molecule that's analogous to double stranded DNA. And then we want to stabilize this RNA using a particular enzyme. I mentioned that we're looking for HIV nucleic acids and nucleic acids are the genome of the virus. The problem with HIV is actually that it experiences a lot of geographic diversity, which means that a patient's particular strain of virus in North America, for example, could be very different from someone in sub-Saharan Africa. So our job is actually to create probes that can detect many different strains of HIV. With these probes, we can then convert the single-stranded RNA into double-stranded complementary DNA strands. This DNA, because it's present in such small amounts initially, has to be exponentially amplified. This is accomplished um, using a process known as RPA, which is an isothermal nucleic acid amplification process that takes very small starting amounts of DNA and at a constant room temperature for around 30 minutes, it will exponentially amplify them so you have millions and millions of copies of this DNA by the time you're finished. Our next step is to be able to properly visualize all of these generated strands of DNA. We have a strip of paper, and on the strip of paper, we have these immobilized probes bound. The amplicons will come over the strip of paper, and they will bind directly to the immobilized probes. Then we have a secondary reporter molecule that will also bind, and this reporter molecule is actually colored, and it will produce a tinted band on the lateral flow strip. So if you want to think about it this way, it's actually kind of like a pregnancy test. A positive, bands mean, a positive band means yes, you have the virus. No band means you're negative. We've talked about the assay, and now we have to think about how we're going to take this assay and really break it down into its most fundamental components in a manner that can be easily translated to a variety of settings. And these settings, although they're very diverse, so patients' homes, hospitals, SED clinics, neonatal clinics, they all really share a common set of limitations. In particular, those limitations include the fact that there is very minimal electricity access, if any, the healthcare workers are poorly trained, poorly equipped, few funds, there's no cold chain transportation or storage. So using these limitations, we can create guidelines for what the device should look like. And for us, that really implied that we needed to create a system which from start to finish is fully electricity free. It's thermostable at a wide range of temperatures, so 10 to 40 degrees Celsius. Um, it can survive for a long time in non-temperature, non-humidity controlled conditions, approximately the size and weight of a phone or this clicker right here. And finally, it must cost under $5 um, in order to pair it with other programs that roll out cost-effective diagnostics in low-income areas. Here's a breakdown of what the entire system looks like, and we can really think about it as being composed of three tiers. The most fundamental tier is this biochemical reaction itself, where we start with whole blood, we process it, and then we get a readout at the endpoint. This biochemical reaction is then integrated onto this microfluidic microchip substrate, 
And the microchip, which contains on all onboard chemical reagents and um, different things involved in the application process, is actually fully automated using an external spring-loaded mechanism. And this mechanism being spring-loaded is also electricity-free, and it reduces all user intervention to simply taking the blood sample, adding it to the cartridge, slotting it into the instrument, cranking it up, and then 60 minutes later, reading the results at the endpoint. And this instrument also costs only $10, which means that the upfront cost associated with buying the system is $10, and then each new cartridge is $5. I talked at the beginning about the importance of providing not just the means, but the ends as well. And what's really vital in scientific research is that when you're creating a technology, you have to commercialize it properly. So to this end, I've really been thinking about what the best business model would be to actually promote this technology and bring it to the people who need it most. So I've created a hybrid business enterprise, which has two branches, a for-profit and a not-for-profit branch. The for-profit branch, it cross-licenses directly with key patent holders in the space, and working with them as our manufacturing and distribution partners, we can sell it to individuals over the counter in North America, um, Eastern Asia, Europe, or through agencies like the BC Center for Disease Control, for example. The profits gained from these sales are then funneled directly into the not-for-profit branch, which also collaborates with various NGOs, and together they actually work to both distribute the device to individuals in Sub-Saharan Africa, rural North America, America, um, East India, and create the implementation programs that really cushion this entire diagnostic scheme, including how do we recruit patients, how do we treat them, how do we counsel, counsel them after they get their diagnosis. So taking a really, really big step back, as far back as possible, we have to think about our vision. And my vision at this point is really to have a healthcare worker who is equipped with both D the diagnostic device and a bottle of pills, going out into really hard to reach areas, conducting testing and treatment at the patient bedside. We then have to ask ourselves whether this particular vision actually falls in line with what we originally set out to do. Because the trouble with the science, and it's a trap that I fall into a lot of times because I really love science, it's that we can get so excited by a particular technology that we're always thinking of spin-off ideas within this common language of science that over time we forget that science is ultimately, it's a language, it's a toolbox, and in no way should we let that limited vocabulary of science restrict our problem-solving abilities. Because these big globe-encompassing problems, they don't call for someone who's just focused in science, someone who's just focused in business or creative writing, rhetoric. They call for a team of individuals who have all of these particular focuses, but who are also able to communicate and be open to sharing that dialogue between them so th such that we can really create a network of ideas. Thank you so much for your time. <laughs>